Uh, we got Benny Adams. Uh, he is from Luster. <laughs> and uh, he's going to teach us like some efficiency workflow tip tricks mm -hmm. and just how right. to be a badass in general mm -hmm. for Cinema 4D. So yeah. let's give him another hand. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Well, I am Eddie Adams, and I work with these three lovely people at Luster. And I'm an associate creative director there. I've been doing 3D there for eight years, and now I'm leading a little bit more, but still doing tons of 3D, lots of After Effects, real flow, all that kind of fun stuff. So today I just want to show you guys a bunch of the slightly less known features about Cinema 4D and workflows that I use a lot of the time, or I've recently discovered that have totally changed the way I work little by little. So I guess a little background on me. Um, my dad had me working on computers when I was really young, so today we are going to do these things. We're going to play on the computer. And that was, that's a real document I wrote when I was, I don't know, seven, six years old. Alright, so let's jump in. So when I was a wee lad, <laughs> I yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've always been on the computer, have loved just dicking around on DOS and kind of learning all the commands, all the, all the art stuff. And when I was like three years old, my dad had me doing like Bezier curves in like paint programs. So for me, it's like so ingrained in me, digital art and, you know, zeros and ones and all this kind of tech inspired art. So then I you know, also went to high school, went to college, got a degree, all that boring stuff. And that brought me here. So another thing about me is I am very OCD and super organized. So one thing I want to start with is folder organization. Ooh. OK. So for smaller projects, I usually don't get this intricate, but if it's a bigger project and there's a client involved and you have multiple people working on stuff, it's really nice to build out a folder structure where everybody is on the same page, you have the same naming conventions. So here you can see like anything that the client sends over we'll throw into the client folder. During the pre-production phase, if it's like a full shoot, we'll have boards and treatments and all the like reference research and stuff will go in there. And then if it is a, a full shoot that's on set and we have a film crew and everything, production stuff goes in there, like production documents, call sheets, all that. And then once we film everything, we start getting into the post-production part of things, where this is where we put After Effects projects, Premiere projects, you know, cinema projects. And so below that is assets. And this is kind of the, the bulk of where everything ends up. So the footage will go in here textures, photos, references that we're using in projects. And then once we get the edit in a good place, if it's like a full commercial or a short or whatever, the works in progress will go into outputs. If we're sending stuff out to client, we'll MP4 it so it'll be nice and you know web friendly. So we can send those out. And then we're finally done when it's the final, final version. <laughs> final. We'll throw it into final deliverables. And that way, if we have to refer to a project a lot later, you know exactly where to look. It'll be the final project, slated or not slated, or whatever versions you output will be in there. And you notice this is uh, OS X, so if you're on Windows, so it's, it's similar, but you notice a few differences. All right, and a little bit more housekeeping here. So, oh god, where are we at? All right. So, this section is about scene structure, which is also organizational. Whenever I start a project, I always try to keep things organized and have a consistent hierarchy. So, if anybody else needs to jump in the project, everything is very explicit. Everything is laid out in a way that makes sense, because you know we read left, right, top to bottom. So the way I've kind of organize things, I always have my camera up top, which has, you know, all the camera stuff, any focus nulls, and then below that are the lights, which is 
in 3D, lights are kind of abstracted. They're not physical. So I kind of keep all that stuff up top. And then once we get into the actual scene, if there's not a lot of objects, I'll keep everything kind of loose out here. And if there's like a ton of stuff, I'll know things into maybe like environment, characters, props, or whatever. But again, I kind of go top to bottom where it's ceiling light, the balls, wall, ground, etc. And because it's cinema, we'll have a nice little floaty ball animation. And how I made this, it's just a cloner with a rigid body, a sphere, and some random effectors in there. So anyway, that's organization. And the front end of this is a little technical, a little dry, but it's stuff that's like right in my heart. <laughs> you guys should follow everything I do so that if we work together, it'll just be like, yes. <laughs> like, you get me, I get you. OK, so one thing that's kind of confusing in cinema is there's preferences and there's settings. And they're kind of the same words, but they're very different things. Oh, first. There we go. OK. <laughs> so, so preferences, if you hit Command E, preferences are all the stuff that's connected to your application. So if you change stuff and open 20 different projects, these settings will stay the same. And it's like your view, viewport stuff, all the stuff that's application specific. But then your project settings are totally different. Those are over here, and that's your frames per second, all your dynamic information, and this stuff gets saved into your scene files. So if you make a change here and someone else opens it, that'll be the same, but their preferences will still be you know, their own preferences. And one kind of hidden feature is that, let's say you want to work in like 30 frames per second all the time because you work on TV in the 90s. <laughs> and, and so let's say you make all these changes, you set up the scene, it's perfect, and in order to have this be the default, you have to save as, navigate to your Maxon folder, and then in this folder, save the project as new.c4d. And if you do that, next time c4d opens, it'll open that file. So whatever you have saved in there will be the default, which is super handy. And they, I know, it's kind of a hidden feature of that. Two things. What's mind, that? Mind blown. Oh, thank you. I'm and awesome. second thing, uh, it wouldn't be 23.97 if it was drop frame. Oh, wait. It was the 90s. It would be 29.97. Well, 29.97. Right, right. There you go. Yeah. I was rounding up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we just had a whole thing with... How are you getting that insane playback in your viewport? Because my, my viewport doesn't look so nice when I hit play. Like the, the frame rate? I'm like the saying, smoothness? When, when you had your ball thing... Business my balls, yeah. Yeah, so you have all your balls. Your balls look so nice. Yeah, yeah. I like, get your balls so nice. So when you hit play, that's not what mine looks like. They're so smooth. Does it? Does yours like? Is it just more stuttery or? Uh, it doesn't look like a render. Uh, well, so I. I am an R18. Yeah. I d I did kind of work this scene to look as nice as possible. I have, you know, hard shadows here, which is kind of casting some shadows. There is a. An ambient light, which kind of right, that's super dim. Well, there's what shadows are those. Are those area shadows or? Um, it's just a hard shadow from the light source up top. So there's a, a light up here that is casting that, and there's ambient occlusion also on these, which gives it a little bit of the depth. And then I threw on a a ball rim to give it a little a little juice. So it's it's just you know bringing all those things together, and I mean the render probably looks worse than the actual viewport. The ballroom yeah. is that is that bouncing off the is that bouncing off the, the is that a is that bouncing off of the, uh, the the ground? ground? Is that uh, that's that's what it's mimicking, it's a, but it's it's a light that I think is only affecting the balls, so it's it's not light enough because if I deleted this or exclude this, you can see it kind of affects the bottom and everything. Oh, but so is, it, or is it just down, is it just below the ball's pointing up? Yeah, I think behind and oh, below. So yeah, I if you see, see from I here, see. I get it. I get it. Okay. yeah. So it's mimicking a bounce, yeah. but 
without having so to actually you're, bounce. You're, you're, um, you're, uh, uh, you're mimicking a um, global elimination, basically. Yeah, more or less. Because in the viewport, you obviously can't do any of that in real time. So I figured throw some colored lights in there and in make other words, it. He's cheating. That's why yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's it for that. Not, there's nothing wrong with cheating if it looks like that. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so for the heads-up display, I decided to make this just absurd thing. I don't even know what I was thinking, but um, so the heads-up display is up here. You've got like your little camera node, perspective, frames per second, grid spacing, all that. And to access that, if you hit Shift V to go to your viewport status or settings and open up the heads up display tab, you get all these sweet options. And one that's really handy is camera distance. So this will tell you how far I think your center of camera is, like the, the focus point of your camera from the camera. So if you're doing depth of field, you can punch that number in and the focus will be right where you need it. There's a few other nice ones like Frame time down here shows your current frame, but you can also click and scrub it, and you can scrub the whole timeline, which is technically cool. I've never actually used it because we've got this guy right here, but you know, there's just nice little little features that are hidden in there. One that's really handy though is if you have the camera one open, you can switch between all your different cameras because right now I have everything hidden down into layers, so everything is hidden, but you can still see all the cameras. So if I'm accidentally in the wrong camera, I can just switch here instead of like finding it here, soloing it, doing all that business. Anyway, um, so that's the first part of heads up display. The second part, which is even more badass, if you hit shift C, it brings up this little, you know, command widget and you can type pretty much anything that you can do in cinema and it brings up, you know, the option. If you double click it, it'll execute that command. But if you click and drag out of the viewport, it brings up another heads up display button. And with these, they always come out so tiny and you can make them a little bigger. But then if you click that, you can just build a cube. It's hidden right now because I'm doing all this soloing in the layers. But this is really handy if you're like having to, maybe you have a whole bunch of materials and you have to like select texture tags and objects. If you have to like find what objects the materials are applied to, you can just you know type in whatever and pull it out and use it as long as you need to. And then when you're done, you can just right click and remove it to can stay tidy. Drop those into palettes. Um. Yeah, you can. So if I was really into cubes, you can just pull it up there and drop it. And now we've got a cube button. Two key buttons to be. The hotkey one more time. What was that? Uh, Shift C is the this window, and then anything else you, to to dock it or to throw it out here, you just click and drag it out of this window. I like that one so much. You use you know the default pilot. Um, it's it's one. The console. Yeah, console. Yeah. He uses Shift C for the same thing. I thought that was Control Space. But Isn't he, that? you can turn it to Shift. He has okay. Control, so you yeah, can yeah. Use Shift C for it too. I dig it. All right, enough of those eyeballs. Now, letterbox. So working at Lustre, we do a lot of broadcast stuff, and so we have to worry about you know, aspect ratio, center cut, title safe, all that kind of stuff. And in cinema, it becomes especially crucial because let's say I have a, a really narrow monitor for whatever reason, and you know the viewport's like this. I'm like, OK, I'm working right here. And it's kind of easy to forget that your viewport is that big or that small. So in the hitting shift V again to go to viewport settings, a lot of times I'll crank the, the tinted border to 98% so you can still get a glimpse of what's behind it, but then it's a lot easier to visualize your framing. So when you're working, you can compose everything really nicely and not have to worry if you're you know, not seeing the whole picture, if you're working in square or a weird format, it just helps you really see what you're working in. And it just looks kind of cinematic when you're like this, like, oh man, must be a, <laughs> something special happening. <clears throat> All right. Shift V settings stay with your project or is that something you're going to 
Um, just hitting Shift V just opens this panel. Yeah, so your settings on that would save your project? Oh, yes. Yeah, so if I open a different project, these should all default to whatever is in new.c4d or whatever is default if you don't have that set up. As far as I remember, I'm pretty sure. All right, and on to default primitives for 200. All right, so in Cinema, you know, you have all your primitive objects. They all have some parametric options so you can change, you know, the number of segments, everything. But sometimes, like let's say you're making a lot of spheres and they always come in like this and sometimes you don't want like all these polygons bunched up here and so you'll have to switch to isosahedron, make some more changes. It takes forever if you're doing it like dozens of times a day. So it's really handy just to go down to here, edit, set as default, it'll give you a little warning and then you'll say yep. And now if you make a new sphere, and then add it to this layer because I have it set up like that. Then your sphere is by default going to be like that. Okay, get rid of that second ball. <laughs> it's a very ball centric presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so that just comes in really handy because I know isosahedrons are just so nice. I know they're all triangles, but still. Exactly. All right, fillet versus bevel. Another very fascinating topic. <laughs> um, so, I know this is all stuff that like... We're fascinated. Okay, good, good. That, yeah, it's, it's technical, but this is the stuff that makes you go from like great to super great. Okay, <laughs> to badass. All right, so in cinema, when you make a cube and you fillet it, it is fillet, it's not fillet, which is confusing, but when you fill it, <laughs> Again, just like those spheres, you get this like super dense polygon, you know, that this point has like six edges coming into it, which is not the best practice. So what I like to do is throw a bevel object as a child of a cube, and that way you get a very different edge, which is all quads, there's edge loops for days, and it's just I don't know, a much a much cleaner way to work with cubes. It's only cubes that has this weird kind of fillet issue, but something to keep in mind, because if you're making a lot of cubes and you have to like do transformations or like bends, it might get kind of bunched up right there. But if it's like this, I feel like it'll deform a lot nicer. Could, could you uh, create a new cube and just walk us through how to get that? Yeah, sure. Here, I'll just default these out. So I got this cube button here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is just a default cube, and you know, in the object settings, like with any primitive, you can enable this, and I think by default it's 20 centimeters and five subdivisions, which you can crank down. That's not so bad, but when you get, like if you really want to smooth that out, oh man, it's, that's super rough right there. Not into that. Um, so to make a bevel, you go into your deformation objects, and down here, sweet little bevel boy. And again, sorry, I have to do this every single time because I have everything organized on these layers. And you just throw it as a child to your object. And by default, I think it's a pretty slim one subdivision bevel. So if you crank that back up to 20 and 5, then you get almost the same thing, but you'll notice the fong edge there. For some reason, it always has a hard edge, so you have to uncheck this fong break rounding, and then it should be identical. I should drop that back down. Identical in appearance, but not in topology. That was a mouthful. All right. Any questions so far about anything or everything? Yeah. Um, that yeah, whatever these, can these you boys. Can you set defaults for those, like you can for primitives? Um, I'm not sure. Let's find that together. Uh, it appears so, yes. Sweet. So yeah, because oftentimes I'll use angle, 
because a little side note, if you have a bunch of these guys and then you throw in a bevel and don't have this checked, it'll bevel every single edge regardless of literally everything. So like if you have a simple object and the bevel is small, that's, yeah, it's just horrendous. So bevel, I always check on this use angle. <laughs> and then, yeah. What is the difference between breaking the bevel angle and changing the bevel angle? Yes, so, God, this is a mess of a cube. Okay, so the angle, th the angle threshold, threshold is, is yeah. like if it's anything above or below 40 degrees, it'll bevel, but it won't. So if, if you have a very slight obtuse angle, it won't touch it. Right. But once you get 40 degrees or more, it will bevel that. Right. So if you don't have that checked on at all, it'll bevel every single edge. And then this one, the offset is just the amount of beveling. Well, I mean, like when it was when you had that hard edge, not, not the, the hard edge, the flong edge, the flong edge. Not the oh, flong oh, edge. copy. Um, this guy. Yeah, because I always find when I'm doing stuff, I always find that I'm fighting in my head between, like, between flong, which flong am I turning off the flong angle or the flong, the flong break, breaking the flong or. Yeah, it sometimes it gets confusing. So the flong tag, you have your flong angle and edge breaks. Yeah. And I think. I think in the models, like, I don't know where the information is stored, if it's in the edge or in the normals, but sometimes if you get, like, weird hard edges and your fong angle is high enough, you can turn this off and it'll soften up those two. Looks like it might have a similar effect to the actual bevel itself. Is that also contingent on a surface setting? The fong break? Uh, how do you mean? Like, is the fong break also in um, no, I think the fong tag is the only thing that determines what angle will be used, I'm pretty sure. And I color code these, red is bad cube, green, good cube. <laughs> okay. And how do you color code them without a material? Ah, good question. So in your basic tab, you use color on, and then you just set whatever color you want, and that's it. Yeah, it should render, or no, it renders as, because as its color. Material. Yeah, if you add a material, it should overwrite anything. But yeah, it's, it's handy if you want to do like very simple like buttons or something, you just need to be a color, but no specifics. I think it looks like it just, oops. I think it just uses the default Cinema 4D material, so you do get that little bit of fong. So you don't really have any options there, but it's handy if you're just doing something simple and just need to colorize some things. All right, let's move on to more fong breaks. Um, this is a handy tool. Sorry, I should have looked at the next section. Oh, no. Well, this is kind of different. So when you're selecting things, you can double click, you know, the polygon mode. It selects all connected edges. And if you do UL, you can do edge loops, which is super handy. But sometimes, like, if I want to select everything here except for this extruded ring, you can hit U in, and this goes into the fong break selection, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. And if you look closely, you can kind of see, like, some blue edges along the sharp edges, and that's telling you where that selection is happening. And right now, it's not that useful because it's just, like, basically an edge selection. But you can hack it by grabbing that fong tag, increasing it until you get smoothness there. And then now, because that fong angle is 50 degrees and this edge is 40-ish, it'll select everything there except where that hard edge is. So if you're doing like, what is it, smooth modeling or hard surface modeling, you can easily select chunks of pieces without wrapping around and grabbing like extra bits. And so that's it's just a handy selection tool that I feel like is, isn't used much, but it can be really handy. And then, of course, just make sure you reset your Fong settings because it does affect how it appears and how it renders. All right, on 
on to selection conversion. God, it sounds so boring when I say it out loud, but it's good stuff. Um, so here we have a happy little wooden boy. <laughs> um, so here, let's say I want to select all the all the points on this like hip joint, and so if you have your point mode, like you obviously can't marquee select it. If you just grab a couple, you can hit U Y and grow the the selection until everything is totally selected, and you can check it. It's, it's good, but that's like 20 steps. So a quick way to do this is if you have the polygon mode selected, like we already demonstrated, if you double click on anything, it'll select all connected polygons. And then if you shift click, it'll convert those to whichever thing you click on. So you can convert to edges, back to polygons, back to points. So it's a really quick way to you know, select a lot of stuff and switch between them without having to go like select, convert selection, points, like this is just super lame. Like <laughs> never do that again. <laughs> shift, shift left click, single click, and that'll, that'll sh shift between everything. No, but <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, ooh, this one's a good one. Path selection. Okay, so we've got this sweet terrain here. And let's say I need to select a one polygon width path, well not that one, from here to way over here. If I hold shift control, it'll do a path selection, which gives a, I think, somewhat efficient route between the two points. If it's a simple object, it'll follow along kind of your edge loops. But in this terrain example, I found really interesting because it, it literally followed the, the shape of the terrain and it avoided peaks and kind of hugged all these troughs, which is kind of surprising. I was pretty stoked when that worked out so nicely. But you know, less convenient for terrain for real world usage. But if you need to maybe select a weird shape and you know, path selection would work, that's, it's a shift control, I think on Mac and PC. And that'll just, you know, get you started at least. And then again, UI is grow, which is super handy. So you can just grow that like crazy. All right. And now on to mesh checking. So here I made a very bad 3D model. And it consists of one object, multiple planes, points everywhere, ingons. This this is one polygon here. I'm pretty sure, like, just just bad stuff. Ne never do it. It was hard to make something this poor. <laughs> so, so to help fix that, you know, you could go in and re rework a lot of it, but. In under mode modeling, there's this mesh checking option, which is again super hidden, but super helpful. So now instantly, everything is color coded with these different colors, marking all the issues, which is literally everything here. Um, and the handy thing is, like here's isolated points. It's a light blue. You can see them very easily here. You can select them just with this button and then hit delete, and it just cleans them right up. It's the same with edge points. These are, I think, are points along edges that aren't contributing to any like topology. They're just kind of errant edges or points. So again, you can select those, delete them, and bam, beautiful 3D model. Um, is that how you get back to this mode window? Yeah, so if we're out here, it's mode, modeling. And then under modeling, you go over to mesh checking and then toggle it there. And then I think you can probably just mesh. Nope, never mind. So you have to do it that way. And yeah, this is really nice because, like, obviously there's issues with this model, but sometimes, like, you might have this shape and you're, you know, think it's pretty good. It's like, oh, it's got a little flap there, but whatever. But, you know, once you get in here, like, oh, there's, you know, this edge here, there's an end gone, there's a non manifold edge here, which isn't good, because as you guys probably know, it's not good to have 
edges or polygons like coming out of other polygons like crazy. It's better to have more of a smooth surface. So yeah, this is just a, a great way to kind of find issues even if you don't understand what you're doing wrong, it'll tell you and it's a good way to learn and check your models. Or if you import a model from like TurboSquid or something, you can check it, see if there's issues. And that never happens. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, set driven. So I made a timely clock here. And I guess I'll start with the clock really quick. So the cool thing about uh, cloners is that if you have a cloner and you have two texts or motex objects that are numbers, it will automatically fill all the in-between numbers as long as your count is equal to the difference of the numbers. So like let's say I make this, oops, okay, I'll tackle this and then go back to that. So the set driven technique is like normally you'll have your motex and you'll say, okay, it says hello, cool, blah, blah. You'll, you'll name it and you have to name everything and then if you have a ton of objects, you'll have to go in and find them, make sure they're named properly, go down to the object tag, select this, change the, oops, change what it says and then be on your way. But there's a little expression we can use. So if we right click on the name of the object and under expressions, you can set the driver and that kind of copies into the clipboard this bit of data. And then if you go over to the object and into the text field, you can basically paste that by setting this as the driven absolute. So what this does is it makes this text field pipe directly into the text of the object. So now if you have like a hundred text things, you can, you know, quickly rename them and you don't have to like keep jumping back and forth. So that's such a time saver. I use this super often. So what I was getting back to is I already set that up for this. So if I change this to six, it becomes a jumbled mess because it's not divisible and yeah. To clean up those decimals, I have no idea, but as long as you have the right number, same as your count, you should get a nice, nice number. Good way to make clocks and nothing else. <laughs> um, all right, sculpting. Before you move on to sculpting, yep. would you mind just doing that one more time? Absolutely. The, the, the set driven? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, I'll delete that and... All right, so right now, this and this are totally separate pieces of data, but this is the same as this, because so you can change you know, the name of your object and it'll change up here. So with that data, you can right click and have it be the driver. So it's driver and the driven, so the driver controls the driven, which makes sense. So you set the driver, you navigate over to where you want it to be driven, or the driven object, and then the same thing, expressions, but instead of driver, it's driven absolute. Absolute means it copies that number exactly. Relative, I think, might like add it to what's already there. So absolute is just always a one-to-one -one way to get that. So then, you know, you've got your editable thing right there. And you can do this with like anything. If I want the like depth to be a subdivision, I might be able to. And each one adds an espresso thing. So you can go in here and like, if you want to add some math to your name or whatever, you, you can go crazy. That's kind of out of the scope of my knowledge, but yeah, really handy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, now for this accidentally ominous bust of a man. Um, so in cinema, if you want to, oh God, is mesh checking on? Stand by. See, there's a lot of non-planar polygons. Very bad. <laughs> Actually, it's not that bad. 
OK. So if you have an object, and this is a male bust, it's kind of a starting object for sculpting. sculpting. You know, you'll, you'll usually go over to your sculpting thing, pick your tools, get in there, and you know, give them a big brow, because that's the only thing that anyone can do with sculpting. But what I've recently discovered is that um, if you're in your normal viewport, you know, there's some availability to right click and go like iron, brush, etc., where you can just like totally get bonkers. But the handier thing, if you do that shift C again, you can call one of those sculpting tools. So without having to hop over, you can just grab the pull tool and manually you know, do, do any of the sculpting stuff without having to bounce, bounce back and forth. So if you just need to tweak your model a little bit and you don't want to like get all into the sculpting, you can just you know, quickly grab this or do smooth and same business. So it's helpful if you're not really into sculpting, but you're, you are modeling something, you can always just grab those tools and they work. And yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I did add the rim light on purpose, and it didn't seen, work. Have you seen the, uh, the HP modeling tools? HP? HP, over at MotionWorks. Hmm. They've got some interesting stuff. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show it to you after. after cool, yeah, maybe throw it up in the Facebook, too. Yeah, yeah. They have some, some, some really cool stuff that, that adds a lot more um, versatility, a lot more ZBrushiness to Oh, to cinema. Yeah. Oh, cool. Next up is Fit to Region. So I've got a fresh apple here, a little waxy, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, not anymore. Uh, so I have a sticker here, and it's got a, a bump, an alpha, it's very beautiful. And when I add it to the apple, it's pretty close. It's not far <laughs> off, not super great though. Um, so a, a handy trick is if you right click on the texture tag, you can fit to object, which is what it does automatically. But if you do fit to region, it gives you a bounding box. And when you drop it, it fits that to the bounding box. And by default, it's tiled. So if you uncheck tile, boom. You got a beautiful little decal, and <laughs> and oops. One thing though, you can't move the camera around while in that mode, so I keep making these little stickers. Does it conform to the aspect ratio of your bounding box, or does it? Yes, it it fills as you can see. Oops, <laughs> as you can see here. So maybe if you hold like shift or something, it might. I know, but once you have it in place, you can go into it. And, oh wait, I thought it, well maybe it sets that as default, but you can adjust it here as well. One thing to note though, it does use flat projection when you fit to region, so there will always be a secondary mirrored sticker on your backside. <laughs> so if you want to get rid of that, you just do this and turn it around and move on. <laughs> um, yeah, with flat projection, it, it goes all the way through. So yeah, so if you, if you want to get around that, you'll have to UV it or something. But um, yeah, yeah, you could do a selection tag too. Yeah, let's do that really quick. So you can grab this. Apply that to that, delete the old boy, and then fit to region, untile it, and we might, oh, problem. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, I think that would work though, yeah. <laughs> the apple has been bitten. All right here, I made a dynamic chain which is always tricky and sometimes a little chunky, but we've got a nice little physics simulation here. And the setup's pretty simple. I have a, a chain link up here, which is a collider body with dynamics turned off. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, dynamics off. So 
gravity isn't affecting it, but it still has collision, so it's able to hold up the rest of the chain. And then I think the only difference on the, the rest of the chain is that dynamic is set to on, so it will be affected by gravity. And, you know, in theory, you could crank this way up and have, you know, nearly infinite chain. I did have trouble, though, with the, the collision, because it's, because each chain is kind of intersecting another chain, you have to have your collision set to a moving mesh, which, which uses all of the geometry of a chain link, or of, of the geometry, including the holes in the middle of a shape. Because if you were to use like a box, that would, have, that would make a box all the way around it, and it would be filled, so the things would just explode because there would be intersection between all of them, and they wouldn't understand they're linked and not just totally mashed into each other. So that is that. So I have a dumb question. Yeah, yeah. Um, cloner, when, when you make the, the chain clone, mm -hmm. in order to get the geometry to be offset by 90 degrees, is there some offset that you're doing in the clone? Yeah, it's right here. Boom. Under whatever this is, object. First step, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, doing it 90 degrees offsets each one you know, indefinitely. All right. And okay, this is probably my favorite one of the bunch. This is my dynamic little buddy. Kind of looks like a poop, but I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna... <laughs> okay, so what we have here is a dynamic joint chain with some hair and some business. Um, and I, I just want to kind of break down the process for this because dynamic joint chains are super cool and fun. They're really good for tails or you could even do like a chain link chain and have a joint system and everything parented to each joint, I think, instead of doing it the dynamics way. So let's hide some of this. So we've got... Our, yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, just, right? There we go. And then, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we've got a sphere as kind of the parent to everything, and there's a vibrate tag on it. And what that does is kind of vibrates either rotation scale or position. So for that, I just have it set to, you know, a large amount of degrees and a small frequency, so it moves pretty slowly. And that just gives it, you know, organic motion. Should that, like, wiggle for after effects? It, exactly, yeah. And then the tail is, on the inside, we've got a nice little joint chain that you can see now. And joint chains are kind of the fundamentals of character animations. Every character has joints and pivots and controls. And in this one, to make it dynamic, you add an IK tag to the parent joint. And then inside of that, you select your end joint, which I named end joint, because I'm efficient like that. Um, and then IK solver, I think 2D keeps it planar, and 3D allows it to be on all axes, from what I understand. And if you are making a character, your goal object would be whatever control controls kind of the end point of that joint. But if you want to do dynamics, you don't have to have a goal. And instead, in the dynamics tag, you just turn that on, and that will enable basically gravity to affect it. And then your strength here will determine how rigid or loose the joints are. So now we have a very kind of flaccid poop. And if we crank this way up, we have a much you know, firmer, like a, like a snake or like an animal tail might be closer to this. Let's turn the hair back on. It's getting uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, with the strength? I think so. I think it was. Um, yeah, all that business is keyable for sure. So you could have it bouncing around or becoming more and less stiff, as also, it were. Also, the, uh, the, the amount of subdivision on the skin, is that something you up, or I'm guessing that's the for sure. Definitely. I, 
Is that just the, is that the polygon guy going there? Yeah, so the, the head of it is just a sphere, and the tail is a cylinder with a taper on it. Oh, okay. And that gives it the tapered quality of it. And then the skin is what's keeping it taut. Right, so the skin is like the, the bind that gets created that kind of tells what to attach to what okay. joint. Okay, so yeah, so I'm guessing I've downloaded, I've gotten some, some hand, I've hand, I haven't done a huge amount of like hands models and stuff, but I've seen a lot of it where they yeah. have like hands and stuff and hands, joints and stuff in them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, is the skin a, a, a default sequel to the object that I don't know about? Yeah, I can demonstrate. Yeah, let me just make a new. So if you create a cylinder, let's see if I can do this real quick, like, and then under character, there's joint, and you can just roll a joint in there. Okay, <laughs> nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it okay. wasn't that good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then with the joints selected, other than the parent, if you just offset in any direction, you can just grow that bad boy up like that. And then you fit it, and then just select everything. And then, where is it? Actually, I think this might have to be editable. And then command bind. And binding creates a skin under your object, and that kind of tells it all this stuff. And then from there, you should be able to grab any joint and animate your little buddy. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and then holding V brings up this guy, and the only time I use it is for switching projects because it's super quick to jump back and forth. It's much like Maya's space bar, how you have that like cascading menu system. And real quick on the hair, hair is so great in cinema, you can adjust stuff like crazy, make it, you know, just bonkers. And a really neat tool is the, is the brush. Yeah, the brush. So you can literally just brush this hair and make it just <laughs> buck wild. And now Pixar is going to be calling up and be like, Eddie, I saw your, your little buddy. <laughs> oh, OK, one last hair thing. Um, there's also cut, which is super fun. So you can kind of shave or trim your hairs. And it's real time and just totally fascinating how quickly it works. So if you want to. If you have like an animal that has short hair maybe along the spine and longer hair in other regions, you can really quickly trim those out and then you know you've got a asymmetrical hair length. I have a super basic UI question. How yeah. Um the to pull it out? Um, yeah, so when you're here, this dotted toolbar here, that's a tear off, and that brings you this guy. In. And I'm sure you can dock it somehow, but yeah, it's really nice if you're working in like one tool set a bunch and you want to use a lot of these tools, and then whenever you're done, you can just clip it out. It also makes great grass. Yeah, yeah, hair is great for grass. And okay, one other thing with hair is that it automatically creates a hair material. And this actually affects the geometry of the hair, which is kind of unique to hair, I think. So if you want it to be extra thick, it will take that information from the material. So now we've got this, I don't even know. OK, <laughs> moving out of this guy. So now for the ultimate pun, we are doing toilet bowling. <laughs> Yes. A solid laugh. Okay. So, in this, <laughs> um, what do we got here? So, so like I'll kind of start bottom up, maybe. Um, so we have this toilet model that comes with cinema. I, I didn't create this for you guys. I'm sorry. Um, so, on 
as a child of, I don't think it has to be a child, but I just threw it in there for organization. I made a motor, which is under the simulate dynamics motor. The connector is also very similar in function. But with a motor, as you can kind of see from this like UI GUI that it creates, it applies torque to any object. And because there's two, you can have a car body and a <coughs> tire you know, moving in opposite directions. So if you, the mass of the body of the car is really large, the wheel won't flip it around, but instead it'll you know, move just like a car would. But if you leave the second object totally blank, it just applies torque to whatever object you have it connected to. And then, and then when you have a motor on something, you also have to have a rigid body tag. Otherwise, it'll apply the force, but there's nothing to apply it to, so it won't do anything. And then for the pins, these are just your standard fare geometry with rigid body and a floor as a collider body. So I think we can do a strike. Let's find out. Or maybe it'll be a flush. Oh, that's poker. Damn it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about motors is they just keep going. And so, so what you get is just this beautiful scene. <laughs> just porcelain and whatever bowling pins are made out of. And yeah, everything's dynamic. There's no keyframes. This is all just you know dynamics and motors and toilets. <laughs> so that's super exciting. It's this is something I'm recently just getting into is the motors, the connectors, all this kind of, I don't know, real-time dynamic animation stuff where you set up a system and then the system just runs. It's really powerful stuff if you can wrap your head around it. It's really confusing to figure out what does what, but it's solid stuff. Did you see Nick Campbell's test with the big little race car tracks? He had all the cars going crazy. Oh, no, I haven't seen that one. They're all true. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, probably. Oh, nice. I'll have to check that out. All right. And for my acting debut, I'm playing Connect Four with nobody. Um, so this is about motion tracking. Is this using R18's new object tracker? Um, I didn't do any object tracking. This oh, is just, okay. uh, just camera tracking. I didn't have time to dive into that because that's new to me and I'd have to totally dive in. Yeah, it, it looks awesome. Um, so for this, before I even set this video up and recorded, I, I took the camera and recorded kind of a, a tracking plate, which is a scene where there's, there's no motion, there's not really any like transparencies or reflections. And from that, if you bring that video into Cinema 40 and track it, it'll give you your camera angle or your, your focal length. And this is something that you can get pretty close with using the lens that you have, but if you have like a crop sensor camera or something, that gets multiplied and like there's all these different parameters that could affect it. So if you shoot a plate and you know it's a very simple scene, you can get a really accurate focal length from your first track. And then for a more complex scene like this, you can, in the motion tracker, you can input the, the focal length as known and constant. And that lets it already know what it's working with. So it doesn't have to calculate that as it's calculating the whole scene. Do you have the plate that you can show? I think so. Because the plate, I'm, I'm not sure. Are you saying the plate is a moving plate or the plate is a static plate? Uh, it's video. No, but I'm saying, like, does the camera move or is it on tripods? Uh, the camera rotates around. Like, it was handheld. So it's not a plate. It's not like you would think of a normal plate. Well, right. It's, it's like a tracking reference. It's like a reference. Sort of. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, pedantic. I'm just trying to understand because I think it sounds awesome. Like, yeah. So, so basically, like if you have a scene and there's a lot of trees blowing around, a tracker is going to have a really hard time, one, tracking it at all, and two, figuring out like the camera lens. So if you do a simple shot where you could, like record a chair and move around or something even less shiny than a chair, it can get really specific and really accurate as to what your I mean, camera setup is. And so yeah. I've been yeah. Doing this for a long time, but. Yeah, I just learned about it, and it, really hard to what you're it yeah, it makes sense. Because in this scene, the the blinds, I'll just play it down. I mean, for this, I'm having a 
do a lot of stuff like icon mockups mm -hmm. stuff like I'm shooting on here and then I'm having to put it in here and then yeah it's here. screen tracking yeah stuff. screen tracking stuff mm -hmm. to put it on here for Cinema 4D like mm -hmm. when I'm putting it into this should I put known but const like unknown but constant because I don't know what the focal length of my iPhone yeah. is yeah you know, so, so you, you're tracking the like, iPhone footage yeah I'm taking the mm -hmm. footage from here gotcha taking it back into Cinema 4D and then and then putting it back Right. Screen matching it back onto the. Yeah, I would say to to use this technique where you you find out the exact focal length, and that should be consistent. I'm basically mocking up the arm mockups, so so mm -hmm. I have to for clients and stuff so to see what it looks like. Right, right, right. So that's what I'm trying to figure out, like, because it asked me that when I'm doing the yeah, yeah. tracking, and I'm like sitting there going, well, it's it, I don't know known or constants. Right. I, I, I don't know the focal. Length. Exactly, which is exactly what yeah. this technique does. So if you shoot something simple, it should get pretty accurate. Yeah. And if you do it a few times, you average all those values out and you'll get a pretty solid number. Okay. And with the iPhone, it's, it's never going to change. So once you do that once, you'll be able to use that forever for, for that exact you know, camera. Yeah, okay. All right. Oh man, it's going to chug because I'm doing a monitor, doing the screen recording. Maybe I can just scrub through. So we get a beautiful track. And then I'll just play it from here. And you'll notice there's a couple pieces anchored to the table. Oh, <laughs> there's also a, a collider on the table so that it was able to catch all the pieces. And obviously there's no reflections, there's no shadows, because this is in the viewport, but... Um, yeah, do you guys want to know all the stuff in this scene? Do you guys get it? Yes. Okay. Did you use an HDRI to, to, for the pieces? To no, the okay. I'll, yeah, I'll start with the, the 3D pieces and work from there. So, for this I just added a bunch of different lights in the scene, different colors. And, let's see, do I have... If I turn, yep. So here you can see the tracking data as well. Oh god. That's a mess. Um, so on the top, you can, I guess you can see a little bit better. So I've got all these pieces here, and for the lights, oh, I have lights hidden. So the lights, you can see kind of the brightness and the color. I have some cool sunlight coming in and some warm indoor lighting to kind of mimic the, the lighting, but it's, it's not HDR or anything like that. And then... For your final render, would you do an HDR? Or ideally, yeah. I mean, ideally, you take a 360 photo yeah. right in there. Or you could, you could just take the video and put it on like inside of Sphere. Yeah, that'd do a, a pretty good job, too. And the, and the little, little chips aren't reflective. They're just like slightly fongy, so you could get away with murder with that. Um, for the cloner, a handy tip is this um, MoGraph selection thing. So if I delete that and delete this, you'll notice that there's chips everywhere, including behind me. And for the purpose of this, I didn't want to do any like occlusion or masking or whatever. So in here, if you go up to MoGraph, MoGraph selection, you can select, oh man, very gingerly select all this. Okay, we're back. Um, and then go back up to MoGraph and, oh, it didn't take, I'm gonna turn off all these. Let's try that once more. So MoGraph selection, and it should, yeah, there we go. You can kind of see those dots turn from black to yellow. So when you have those selected, it's literally selecting those instances in the cloner. And then back up at MoGraph, if you hide selected, it just turns those off. So you can kind of manually select and pull them out without having to use, well, it actually does make an effector, but it's super quick and nice just to kind of 
cut away some of the clones. And let's see what else is in there. There's the table collider, which is a little wonky, but that's what the things were bouncing off of, and that just had a collider body tag on it. What's that? Yeah, you'd want to like yeah. catch those reflections and yeah. shadows and everything. And I mean, that's kind of it for the scene itself. In order to track it, if you guys haven't tracked before, you go up to Motion Tracker. You can do a full solve or just make the Motion Tracker objects. And then in here, pipe in your footage, enter all the information that you can. And then you do a 2D track to get all of the motion data and then the 3D track to kind of extract all the 3D data. That's kind of a, a process, so I won't get too much into that. Do you guys have any questions on this this bit? Yeah. Uh, for the table collider, did you, just, did you basically just model, you know, this is basically a 3D model of it, or is it just kind of, yeah, it's, kind of wizardry? But no, it's just like a plane that I extruded the, the actual game board out of. But using the location of all these little points, I was able to get a pretty accurate location. Like here you can see the board is that little bump there and then the table is there. And you'll notice that everything's curved because of the curvature of the lens. If I was a little bit more pro, I would import the lens profile, which I think undistorts that. But I haven't dived into that. But even then you still get a sense of the size and scale of everything. It allows you to play stuff in 3D really quickly. Generally, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because actually I would do a mix of standard or physical render and octane, because standard and or physical is, the, uh, Cinema just has the new shadow catcher, which is really nice, so you get those contact shadows, which octane can pretty much do too, but yeah, you'd want to catch shadows, you know, mimic reflections, do as much as possible to kind of emulate the real world of it. And shadows on each, like shadows cast on other chips and all that business. And then speaking of compositing and After Effects, the last, <laughs> the, the last and probably most uninteresting of them all is it's just one of those technical things. Um, so here I made a scene of a camera basically doing a 360 around this highway sign. And let's say the client wants to put their offer or their super up here saying, you know, Ford final days, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we do a lot of Ford stuff and it's awful. Um, so anyway, so you have this and you could render it and texture it in 3D, spit it out, composite, whatever. But you know, the client comes back, they want to change the number so you'd have to re-render the whole thing, recomposite it. But if you have external compositing tags set up on this little section, the sign itself, like this, oh, let's not move the camera. Uh, the sign itself, I want to export to After Effects so I can change it, update it, even animate it in After Effects and everything will just stick on there. So this guy, if you go right click, Cinema 4D tags, uh, external compositing, that will basically tell Cinema to export this when you spit it out to After Effects. And it just gives location data, but you can also have it export an After Effects solid with a height and a width, or width and height. And that information is down here. So it's 421 by 224 centimeters. So previously I piped that in so that finally when we open our render settings, under the save tab in the compositing project file, you check save for After Effects or Nuke or whatever you want. Include 3D data, which I think includes cameras, lights, and anything that you have selected to export. And then save the project <coughs> file. And then here, save that out. And then over in After Effects, 
One thing though, before you do this, and maybe this is a little technical, but um, you have to go into your Maxon installation and grab the <laughs> After Effects. Seriously, right there. that's why I can't afford this shit? Yeah, I don't know why it's not like a, a, a default thing, but you have to grab this and I know you, if you, if you Google it, it, you can download this directly from Maxon, I think. They have a little downloads page, but I mean, this will be on the video if you need to reference it later or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> so you have to copy this plugin and then back in the After Effects file structure in, in, in Maxon, though. You still have to copy it to After Effects, as far as I know. So then plugins, format, and I think there we go. So until you do that, it'll error out when you try to import. After you do that, it'll work swimmingly. So then when we go import that, the solid, it brought in the, or the name of the object, which is super nice, totally up my alley. What we see here, though, is a missing footage link. That's because I didn't render the scene. I only exported the AEC file. So if you did a full render, it would automatically bring in all those renders, have everything in the comp, but because we're not rendering anything right now, that's just gonna be blank. So opening the comp, we should see oh, such a beautiful animation right there. And you'll notice that there's a ton of lights, an extra camera, that's because it pulled from the entire project, not just what was visible. So you have you know that old ball rim, all that stuff, you can just kinda delete, keep the camera, keep the sign. And so if you wanted to put something in there, we can get rid of this too. So if you want to put something in there, all you need to do is pre-comp it, open up that pre-comp, and that makes the entire solid exactly the same as the pre-comp. And then you could just bring in this guy, fit that to comp, and then back out. We've got a perfect track. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, um, the animation is waving you guys goodbye because that was the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the geometry wasn't rectangular. Either. Right, so it, it, it only brings in an After Effects solid, a rectangular solid. If you have a sphere, mm -hmm. you're not going to get a sphere out of it. It's going to just have a solid in the anchor, posi anchor point of that object. So you can do yeah, so for that, you would maybe use Cineware or pre-render stuff. But for screen replacement, billboard replacement, that kind of, like, planar stuff, it works really well. And that is it. Hey, hey. Yeah. Do you prefer using AEC for that kind of workflow versus using Cineware? Um, I feel like, so the, when you export the, the project from here, you get... All of the renders pulled in, they're already in the comp. The comp is set up to your project frame rate. So it already like sets up the, the compositing workflow for you. Where Cineware, you bring in the, the file and then you like extract it and you just get a bunch of stuff. And then you usually have to like pull in renders still. Like it's it's give or take, like I, I use both quite a bit, but this is really nice because I feel like you have more control of, over like what you're getting and how it's imported into After Effects. Especially when you're starting out on new files. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. If you had maybe a bigger project and you had multiple things happening and you just needed to bring in like multiple 3D assets and maybe Cineware is better. I don't know, do you guys use the two much? Do you have input? I think if you're already in the middle of a project, you know, then yeah. you just, just go back to Cinema and match the settings before you import the file. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure it does. Yeah, it's it can be a bit finicky. Yeah. But you can with the AECs, like I have an older version, you can import that and it's just it imports again, it doesn't like replace your whole project. Especially when we start adding stuff in like octane, you know, they just it just starts to get even more buggy. Yeah, yeah. 
for Octane, I would just render in Octane and yeah. not even touch yeah. any compositing software. Just yeah, yeah. read out of Octane, you're good to go. Yeah. Post it on Instagram, 1,000 followers, easy. <laughs> uh, any other questions or praise, please? <laughs> Yeah. I have a stupid question, but do you guys remember there was like a plugin and I cannot remember how long ago this was, but it was for revision used to make this something Real Smart Motion Blur? No, but it was a it was it was the same company, but they had it was like a texture that you put on something in Oh the UV coordinates map? Yeah, yeah, yeah. UV coordinates map. Is that still a thing? Yeah. It's, use it? uh, it's been a while. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't used it in a while, but it, it, that's another H good way to. And the HP modeling bundle that I'll post, I'll post up on the Facebook page, they have a whole thing on that thing. They have a, what's it called? HP modeling bundle. Yeah. 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 I think UV remap, is, I'm yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, sure, is the yeah, name yeah, of it. Uh, there's a, a lot of people on the, on the, on the, the, uh, the, the Facebook page have been talking. There's a substance painter and stuff. A lot of people are talking about UV mapping and stuff. Because um, uh, cinema is not the best. All right, it's let's bring up so our... Is great for it, but it's not so. All right, we'll just let this run. Let's make sure everything's okay. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> I think that says it all. All right, let's get that again. Thank you.